uh, I think there's like new records every single day about how hot it's been getting. Um, ironically, you know, I'm, I'm from Texas, so temperature-wise, this is not bad, but Texas doesn't have the humidity of Korea, unless you're from Houston. Um, Houston's kind of like this all the time, but anyway, um, you know, it's, 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 it's been rough. Um, thank goodness for air conditioning. For those of you that don't have it, Jimmy, I'm sorry. Um, it's, it's been a difficult season. Uh, for us, you know, we were, we were recently in the States, and um, it was warm there, but it wasn't like this. So I remember, you know, we were coming, to, coming off the airplane, and that wave of Korean heat and humidity hit us, and welcome back to Korea, it was. Um, but yes, uh, let me go ahead and get us started for today. We are continuing in our series in the book of Judges. Uh, we are right in the middle of the story of Samson. And so for us to get into it today, the question I want to ask you is, have you ever been disappointed by someone that you saw as a potential role model, example, someone that you had high expectation and anticipation? Anybody? I think most of you have had someone in your life or even if you can think of like public figures, right? You know, in this country, I'm sure there are people that might not be, you know, they might not be so happy with our current president. Um, granted, anyone who is, you know, who took over after the president before, that's going to look good anyway. <laughs> but you know, like there are people who are not happy, right? Uh, same thing with the states. Now, the states is a whole other issue because people weren't happy from the very beginning. <laughs> um, but even I would say even Obama, right? There was a lot of anticipation, a lot of expectation that he was going to change America. I was actually in Washington, D.C., like literally the day before inauguration weekend. And the whole city was just on a bus. I was at a, what was it, Ben's Chili Bowl? Uh, it's a, Ben's Chili Bowl is a very well-known uh, like, like a chili hot dog place. And actually, Obama had been there just a couple days before. And so everybody was at Ben's Chili Bowl. And there was a car that was parked that had a, a Barack Obama song that the guy made that it was playing. It was like, Barack Obama. And it's like, it was like this song. And like, everybody's like excited. And, I, and like the next day was inauguration. And like it was just crazy. But honestly, and granted, I was outside of the States for most of his, uh, for most of his terms. But I would say many people were probably disappointed. Right? There was a high expectation that wasn't met. And so for some of us, it might be more personal. Maybe people like, you know, more, more closely connected to us, uh, teachers, parents. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of pastors that have disappointed you, for those of you that are in the church. So for many of us, we have gone through this cycle before, where there are people that we look up towards, and unfortunately, they don't quite meet the standard that we have placed for them. With that, we're going to go into Judges 14 and see how this relates to that. So Judges 14, open up your Bibles, smartphones, or look at the screen. Judges 14, starting from verse 1. Where the Lord says this, Samson went down to Timnah and saw there a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. His father and mother replied, Isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among your own? All there are people, must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, get her for me. She's the right one for me. His parents did not know that this was from the Lord, who was seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines, for at that time they were ruling over Israel. Samson went down to Timnah together with his father and mother. As they approached the vineyards of Timnah, suddenly a young lion came roaring down toward him. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands, as he might have torn a young goat. But he told neither his father nor his mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and he liked her. Sometime later, when he went back to marry her, he turned aside to look at the lion's carcass, and in it he saw a swarm of bees and some honey. He scooped out the honey with his hands and ate as he went along. When he rejoined his parents, he gave them some, and they too ate it. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey from the lion's carcass. Now his father went down to see the woman. And there Samson held a feast, as was customary for young men. When the people saw him, they chose thirty men to be his companions. Let me tell you a riddle, Samson said. 
uh, Samson said to them, if you can give me the answer within the seven days of the feast, I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. If you can't tell me the answer, you must give me 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. Tell us your riddle, they said. Let's hear it. He replied, out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. For three days, they could not give the answer. On the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, coax your husband into explaining the riddle for us, or we will burn you and your father's household to death. Did you invite us here to steal our property? Then Samson's wife threw herself on him, sobbing, you hate me. You don't really love me. You've You've given my people a riddle, and you haven't told me the answer. I haven't even explained it to my father or mother, he replied. So why should I explain it to you? She cried the whole seven days of the feast. So on the seventh day, he finally told her, because she continued to press him. She, in turn, explained the riddle to her people. Before sunset on the seventh day, the men of the town said to him, What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? Samson said to them, If you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have solved my riddle. Then the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. He went down to Ashkelon, struck down 30 of their men, stripped them of everything, and gave their clothes to those who had explained the, who had explained the riddle. Burning with anger, he returned to his father's home, and Samson's wife was given to one of his companions who had attended him at the feast. It's kind of weird to say amen there. Um, but yes, 2018, again, our theme for this year, Emmanuel, which means God with us, is that we would experience the presence of God regardless of what season we're going through. And ironically, it seems like many of our people are in a wilderness season right now. I know there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of difficulties that our people are going through right now, and so I apologize. Uh, people have blamed me for choosing this theme, but regardless, God is with you. Amen. Okay, um, as we go through the book of Judges, we have seen this cycle again and again on how the Israelites continue to fall away from God. And in spite of them essentially cheating on God and worshipping the gods of the, the pagans around them, God sends oppressive forces that, that overpower them, and as they cry out, God answers their cry and raises up a judge, and again and again and again. And we are on the final judge of this, this story. But as we saw last week, as we saw the birth of Samson, his parents didn't even understand that there was an angel of the Lord that came to them not once, but twice. And it wasn't until he went up in flame that they realized that they had been in the presence of an angel of God. So brothers and sisters, a reminder for, for, for last week is, is to understand that God oftentimes encounters us in very tangible and real ways and gives us very clear answers to the things that we are asking upon him. But we need to be close to him. We need to recognize who he is sending to us, what he is saying to us. Because when we don't, we're just in the state of confusion as the parents of Samson were until the very end of the story. So continuing on, just to remind us who Samson is. Samson's mother could not give birth, right? And it's really interesting because in the Bible, this, this tends to be a very recurring theme. Is this, this woman who cannot give birth to a child, when God finally opens up that womb, is like a special baby. And so here we have this miracle baby that comes from this woman who could not give birth. And an angel Lord had told her, you're going to give birth and you are going to consecrate this baby to the Lord. You are going to have him make a, a Nazarite vow. He is going to be the Lord's child and he will... And then we see at the end of chapter 1 that he is empowered by the Holy Spirit. So this is, this is a very special child. Right? So because of this... If you are reading the book of Judges, so if, you're, you know, if you were a, a good Jew and you were reading the book of Judges for the first time and you get to this point, you have this anticipation that this baby is going to be amazing. You have read the story of Judges, you have seen how, how human and how flawed each and every judge has been, and you're like, this is finally the story where things are going to turn around. This is finally where, where this guy is going to be raised up and he's going to be a, a godly man, he's going to do amazing things. And he is going to free Israel from their enemies. So that is what is an, being anticipated going into this chapter. Right? So this is what the, the casual reader would have expected going into chapter 14. But as you look at the text, people would have been very disappointed. Right? It's funny that Wujin is here because I keep saying that, that this is a story you don't really want to teach your children because Samson is really, really messed up. <laughs> it gets worse. 
maybe he shouldn't be here next week and the week after. But <laughs> anyway, like Samson is one of those people you really don't want to be like. Okay, and I'll touch upon that again later. So people have this expectation on this this miracle child. And then right from the beginning, it starts off by saying Samson went down and saw a Philistine. Okay? Now this, this phrase went down is important because it's going to be repeated three times alone in this chapter, and I believe two more times in the next chapter. So there is this constant theme of Samson going down. Not only physically is he going down, but there is this understanding that he is spiritually lowering himself. So there is Samson going down, and he literally sees a woman. That's it. He sees her, and he goes back home, and he says, Mom, Dad... I found my wife. Okay. <laughs> That's it. All he did was see. And so, brothers and sisters, you know, some of us are married, some of us are not, but I don't know about you, but this is not your, your typical way of how you want to find your, your, your spouse. Right? Now, ironically, if you really think about today's age with like the new like, apps like Tinder and stuff like that. It's kind of what people are doing today, honestly. Um, it's, it's all based on looks. But, but basically, Samson was completely just focused on the physical appearance of this woman. And from that physical appearance, he made up his mind, this is the woman for me. Right? Now, brothers, let's be honest, we're kind of like this at times. <laughs> uh, we are creatures of sight, <laughs> and so when we see things we like, we react. That, that's, that's kind of how guys tend to be. Um, but Samson is your ultimate dude. He sees, and he wants, and he gets. That's what he does. Moving on. Um, so he, he, his parents are like, come on, can't you find anybody else like among your own people? And they even talk about how the Philistines are uncircumcised, kind of emphasizing how they are not his people. But Samson says, no, she's the one for me. And so they go along with it. They take him down to Timnah, and they let him have his way. And what we see from the text is that he is actually doing what God intends, as strange as this might be. He is doing something that is actually very ungodly. He's doing something that is actually against God's desire for him. But at the same time, it's actually part of God's plan. And I'll get to that later. So basically, you know, I, I, I stole some more cartoonish pictures because some of the more graphic ones, like Samson's always like naked. Um, I noticed in, in a lot of the other pictures I saw, I thought that was a little bit inappropriate. Regardless, um, so Samson, he goes with his parents, and I guess Samson is by himself for a moment, and this lion just shows up. And this lion attacks him, and it talks about how the Spirit of God comes upon him, and he rips this lion in half as if he's a young goat, which is a really strange image, because I don't know how often people rip young goats in half. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, you know, that's how easily he destroys this, this fierce lion. And so he doesn't think anything of it. I guess Samson has many such encounters where the Spirit of God comes upon him, and he does amazing things that he just kind of... Just kind of continues on in the story. doesn't tell his parents what happened. And so the text says he goes down again. Right, This is the second time he uses that phrase, Samson went down. And he finally talks to the girl for the first time. Wow, he's making progress. <laughs> he saw, he liked, and he talked, and it says he likes her again. Right? So I guess maybe he had good intuition. I don't know. Um, but he finally talks to the girl after they basically already said that he's going to marry her. Okay? Um, and then, while they are preparing for the wedding, and, and Samson comes back much later. This is, not, this is not just a day later. This is much, much later. So he remembers about the lion. He goes back to the body of the lion. And lo and behold, this lion has bees. It's a very unusual picture, right? It is a dead animal that has probably started to rot away, right? Because it's been some time. And inside of this dead animal, you have a colony, a hive of bees that is producing honey. So a lot of time has passed. This, this isn't something that's going to happen in a couple days. 
Now, if you really think about it, this is a very interesting image. Right? Like, this is something that is very unnatural. I don't think I've ever heard of bees, you know, setting their hives in dead animals. It just doesn't happen. So automatically, a normal person would be like, wow, this is, this is really interesting. And, and him being a good Jew should have probably been like, maybe God is trying to show me something from this. But instead, Samson doesn't do that. Instead, he's like, ooh, honey. And he takes the honey, he starts eating it. Oh, that's pretty good. And then he takes some, and he starts giving to his parents, and he doesn't tell them, you know, where it came from. Right? So, basically what we can tell from Samson is he does whatever he wants. Right? He sees the girl, he likes her, he says, I'm going to marry this girl, all right, mom and dad, make it happen. He sees a bear, he sees a lion, he rips it in half. that's not really a guy thing. But <laughs> and then he sees a hive of, of, of bees inside of a lion, and all he does is he just eats the, the honey. He just basically follows his own wishes, his own desires. You could almost say, you know, he's following both his stomach and other parts of his body. <laughs> but anyway, so, so Samson does whatever he wants. And he continues on, and he he throws this wedding feast, right? And um, he doesn't know anybody here, right? So basically, the Philistines are like, "Okay, we're going to give him, we're going to give him thirty young men." Now, some of you might see this and be like, "Oh, what nice Philistines! They see lonely Samson, and they are giving him, you know, like friends, right?" That's actually not quite what's happening. Basically, they don't trust the guy, okay? So they're surrounding him. This, these are basically like people that are just watching Samson. It's almost like bodyguards that are just making sure he doesn't do anything suspicious. So they surround him with 30 men who are, who are, who are not in a friendly situation. They're basically just making sure that you know, they're just watching over him. But, but what you have to really get from this text up until this point is that Samson has no issues with the Philistines right now. He should. He should. But so far, he has fallen for a Philistine woman, and now he is he is having a wild party with these Philistine men, and he's just enjoying it. Okay? So what we're seeing is, as I reminded you last week, this is the final judge, and in this story, unlike the other stories before it, Israel never asked God for help. In all the previous stories, Israel cries out, God asks. This is the one story where Israel doesn't ask for God. They are okay with the Philistines ruling over them. That is the situation. The Philistines have taken over, they have conquered them, and the Israelites are just fine with it. And as we see from Samson, he is the same way. He has fallen for one of their women, he is hanging out with 30 of their men, and he has no problems. He's enjoying himself. And then he gives one of the most ridiculous riddles I've ever seen, right? Out of the eater or something to eat. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's basically, no one would know the answer to this riddle except for him. So he puts them in a situation where they cannot answer him. No one can answer him except for him. This is a very unfair riddle. Okay? Anybody ever like riddles when you were kids? Some of you guys did, right? Um, I kind of did for a little while. Right? You know, what are those like, uh, those like, those like weird like um, puzzles where like someone like tells you like a, a story and then you have to like figure out like who they are and stuff like yeah, you guys know that stuff. Anyway, sorry, I'm being really vague. Sorry. <laughs> Regardless, Samson gives him a riddle that is unsolvable. And ultimately, they get angry, they get upset, and they turn to his now wife. And they say, this is your problem. You brought this man, and he is now going to take away our valuable property. You need to find the answer to this. And they even threaten, saying, we're going to burn you and your family. So this is, these are not good people. 
right? <laughs> um, I wouldn't want to hang out with Philistines, okay? Um, so ultimately, they, they, re they realize that the way to conquer Samson is through his wife. And this is a recurring theme that you will see as we continue in the story of Samson. Samson, for as strong as he is, Samson, for as stubborn as he is, his parents have no control over him. The one thing he gives over to is women. And we will see this later on. And like I said, Samson is kind of like any other dude. <laughs> no matter how strong a guy is, I think most men will give in to women if they like them. Right? Like, that's just the reality of how it is. And so they find Samson's weakness. And brothers and sisters, what I want us to be reminded of is for our own selves, whatever weakness we have, and as, 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 as well as we might be able to hide it from others, I think there's a, a, a small lesson to learn from this is that the evil one always finds out what your weakness is. You can't hide it. So we have to find ways to address our weaknesses in a, in a, a, a godly and in a way that, that we embrace and, and involve our community. Whereas Samson, he's on his own. They find his weakness and he gives in. And so ultimately, he gives a very crass statement by saying, you, you know, if you had not plowed with my heifer. Right? So basically he is calling his wife a heifer. This is a heifer. Um, a heifer is a female cow that has not yet given birth to a calf. Right? Um, you could almost say it's like a female virgin cow. Um, in, in terms of how cows function, in my understanding is the heifer is one of the workhorses, um, and especially for milking, they are the primary like milk producing cows because once a, a cow gives birth to a calf, physical, uh, physiologically the body changes and it can't produce um, as well as it could beforehand. So typically the heifer is your, your, your work, you know, your work cow, right? But all that said, this is not an endearing comment that he is making about his wife. You know, for, you know, for those of you that have been going to the Bible study and you've been going to the Song of Solomon, sometimes Solomon calls his wife some weird things, right? But there's like something romantic about it. You just have to understand the story. But here, Samson is not being romantic. There's no thing, nothing poetic, right? So men, don't don't be like, oh, my little cow, dear wife. It's, 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 there's nothing pleasant about this image. So he's actually giving a very crass image of his own wife when he says, if you had not plowed my heifer. Right? And so this shows you his heart. This is a man that, you know, he doesn't, you know, he has married this woman, but at the same time, this is his thought of hers. He looks at her like a cow. And so after his riddle has been solved, the Holy Spirit comes upon him again and he goes and he, 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 you know, he has to pay this debt of 30 sets of clothing. So he goes and he kills 30 random men. Okay? Again, Samson is not a good person. He just goes to another town of Philistines and he kills 30 random men He's like, okay, I, I completed my, my job. Here's your clothes. And, you know, the clothes probably has blood all over it and stuff like that. <laughs> you know, like, this is not a, a fun image. But this is what happens. Now, let me explain why this whole story happened. Basically, God allowed this to happen because God was using Samson as the final judge of this story. And ultimately, God desired Samson to have a reason to hate the as I shared with you before, once he married this woman, he's having a party with these other Philistines. He has no problem with them. But this had to happen for him to have a rift and for him to see them as his enemies, which we will see in the next chapter. Okay? So this is the start of that. The whole reason why this whole, the whole story happens is because God desires Samson to view the Philistines as his enemies. Now what is unique about Samson, unlike all the other judges, all the other judges, they raised up armies, they, they had war, and, and, and you know, they fought um, these, these public battles. With Samson, it's just himself, and everything is personal. When Samson fights the Philistines, it's because he's angry at them for something they did to him. It's a personal fight between him and the Philistines. 
And so this is how it starts. Now, as I said before, for those, uh, for those that are reading the story for the first time, that realize, oh, Samson, he's a miracle baby. He's been consecrated by the Lord. He has the Holy Spirit. Even in this chapter, two times it says, the Holy Spirit comes upon him. There is this expectation, and all you see in this chapter is disappointment. This is a man you don't want to be like. Now, if I remind you, the Nazarite vow that he was held to from birth was these three main things. He wasn't supposed to drink anything fermented, um, no wine. Uh, his hair wasn't supposed to be cut. And he was never supposed to be near a dead body. But what we see from the story is he has broken almost all these things. He touched a dead lion. He took honey from a dead lion. He gave that honey to his parents. Not only has he defiled himself, he has defiled his own parents. He chose a Philistine wife, which was not what, what, what God told his people not to do for, for specific reasons. And then he held this wedding feast, which at the time, the Philistines, it was basically just a drunken wedding feast. So most likely, he drank wine. So the only thing Samson has not done to keep his vow is he has not cut his hair. As I say, his lovely hair. <laughs> Yeah, Samson maybe could have done like those Pantene Pro V commercials. <laughs> like this is a whole mass of hair, <laughs> just waving in the wind. I don't know. I don't know. That, that must be a very disgusting image of a big hairy guy. But anyway, regardless, he has failed in almost every single way. This is who Samson is. But at the same time, if we were to fast forward and we look at at who Jesus Christ is. Jesus is the anti-Samson. Where Samson has failed in every single way, Samson has not realized who he is, he has not understood that it is the Holy Spirit that is empowering him, Jesus Christ, just like Samson, was called to be spiritually pure. In that sense, rather than being a physical Nazarite, Jesus was a spiritual Nazarite. In that sense, Jesus, knowing who he is as the Son of God, he chose to do what was right before the Lord every single time. Whereas when you look at the story of Samson, he always chose what was best for him. What he desired, what he wanted. Now if we turn this to the flip side, ultimately, us in Israel, we're the Samsons. Just like Samson, Israel was called to be the holy people of God. Just like Samson, Israel has been given an intimate relationship with God and is actually dwelling with his, his temple, with, which within it is the very presence of God. And in that same way, brothers and sisters, we as Christians, we who have accepted Jesus Christ into our lives, we are called as the holy people of God. We are called sacred and sanctified. His elect, His chosen. You know, we did a Christian Identities class last year, and in that we saw that there are many things that are being proclaimed over us. And the primary one is that we are all sons of God. He views us as His most precious. And He also views us as His heirs. That is our identity. The moment you accept Christ, your complete identity has been transformed. So just like Samson, you're chosen. You're consecrated to the Lord. You're called holy. And just like Samson, the Holy Spirit dwells inside of us. This is a reality of who we are. But unfortunately, even though this is the reality, even though this is what God has proclaimed over us and what God reminds us through the Bible... In terms of how we act, we often act like Samson. Maybe not to his extreme. But brothers and sisters, when we look at the choices we make, rather than understanding our identity, we are influenced and shaped by other things. Right? There are other pressures, other, other forces outside of us that we are controlled by. Rather than understanding that we are actually free rather than understanding that we are sons and daughters of God. And so ultimately, brothers and sisters, when we look at this chapter and we look at Samson and we're horrified by him and we're like, my God, what is wrong with this person? 
what this is often supposed to remind us is to look at our own lives and be like, man, what's wrong with me? If I really understood who God is and who He has made me to be, then I shouldn't have done these types of things. I should be choosing a different type of life. But brothers and sisters, what I want to I want to remind us is, you know, we are we are going to have our failures. We are going to ultimately screw up at times. But what the story tells us, even Samson, in in the many bad choices he made, it was actually still advancing the will of God. Okay? So what I want us to understand is, even as we fall and even as we fail, God, that doesn't thwart the will of God. If anything, God can actually use these failures many times to continue His work. But brothers and sisters, the, the main thing I really want us to focus on today is know who you truly are. You are a son and daughter of God. He has given Jesus Christ to die for you to take away whatever burdens that might still be hindering you today, right? Whatever, whatever expectations that have been placed upon you that you feel like you can't meet, God has lifted those away from you. He has chosen and loved you for who you are. There is nothing you need to do to earn that place with Him. Now that doesn't mean that we're free to just do whatever we want, like Samson. What that means is, now that we understand our identity, now that we understand who God is and what He has set us free from, now we should be choosing to live for Him. <coughs> I've used this analogy a couple times, and at some point, at some point, I hope to be able to speak this, to this from actual life, but, but basically my understanding of parenting, I don't have any kids yet. Uh, my understanding of parenting is that the most precious thing for a parent to see is when a child chooses to obey them without having to be told. Right? When a child chooses obedience, that is one of the greatest ways for them to show love to the parent without the parent telling them what to do. And in that same way, if we understand our relationship with God, when Jesus talks about how do you show love to Him and to God the Father? It's by obeying. And choosing to obey before you're even told what to do. Okay? So brothers and sisters, I want to just plead with you guys. Know who you truly are. And also know that these, these people that we look towards, you know, I started with this, this concept of being disappointed. Sometimes there are people that we look up to so highly that when they fall and when they disappoint us, it completely destroys us. That happens from time to time. And I want you to understand, people will often disappoint you. That is the unfortunate reality of life. But God will not. So back in 1999, when I was, I think, a, a sophomore in college, I came up with this quote, people suck, or 1999, people suck, trust God. You can quote me on this. <laughs> pastor Dehom, before he was a pastor, 1998, he was an engineering student, as a sophomore, this was the quote I came up with, people suck, trust God. And what I realized as a sophomore in college, it's ironic because we just visited my campus a couple weeks ago, um, I just realized that people always let you down, but God will not. So brothers and sisters, I want us to be reminded, you're going to make mistakes. You are going to disappoint yourself. Others will disappoint you from time to time. But know who you truly are. Know that God has, has chosen you, has consecrated you, has made you holy and loves you for just who you are. You have nothing to prove to Him. You have nothing to prove to others. Don't dwell on the past. Put it before. Let's take some time to pray. Go ahead and close.
want you to take a moment to just pray and ask God to just remind you of, of who you are to Him. You can look at different identities, whether it's knowing that you are a son or daughter of God, or whether it's knowing that you have been called one of His holy ones, one of His